Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, uh, Anusha has a question up for her uh, query. It says, I'm a doctor by profession, recently moved to assistant of pediatric cardiology department. I don't know if this is God's will or not, but every day I'm finding it difficult, not about the work, but my heart, not able to feel satisfied about the work. I'm not able to find out a problem with my, what's the problem with my heart? Uh, or anything else, how to seek God's will in this situation. So um, I don't know why you move to, uh, you know, to the pediatric cardiology department. I don't know if it was your choice or you had to, you know, you just picked it up or you were asked to move into that department. I don't know um, the reason. But, you know, you can always um, ask God. He's a God who leads and guides. He's interested. He delights in your ways. He knows what you're going through. He sees your heart condition. He knows your challenge. He knows your struggle. So maybe the, the, the restlessness, the anxiety, the, you know, the disinterest, okay, it's not your interest. Okay, so if it's not your interest, then your heart is not there, right? So, oh, you're forcefully moved. Sad to hear that. Uh, so maybe you can just pray and ask God, you know, uh, what he wants you to do. You're in this situation where you are forcefully moved. What is the next step you need to take? God, show me uh, which department you want me to go. Uh, you know, where is your heart? What you want to do? Just, you know, like we said, you know, we have plans and purposes. We can write it down. We can just give it to God, yield and submit it to God, and let God move and have his way. So you can tell God. You can tell God what you're, go you're going through. He knows. But then you can say you've been forcefully moved here. You, you're not interested, and it's an important department, cardiology, the pediatric cardiology. So you say, God, you know how life-threatening it can be, how important it is for me to have my heart, mind, all my being there even as I'm working. So God, um, you know, uh, maybe take a couple of days off, you know, just just move out. Uh, maybe talk to some people, you know, have a mentor or a pastor, just talk, share. Uh, look at what department you like to move to. Find out about that department and uh, pray about it and ask God what he wants you to uh, do. So maybe the, the whole thing that... The distress, the anxiety, the your heart not being there it can also be, you know, something that, you know, you need to wait on God and ask God and uh, to see where he wants you to move. I think that's a good thing to do, you know. Um, just take a couple of days off, just relax so that your uh, mind is quietened down. You can hear what God is telling you uh, because when you're very anxious, you know, with your own a uh, load of um, thoughts and your brokenness and uh, your struggle, you will not be able to hear God clearly. So just good to unwind, leave everything, just stay or two, just wait on God. And I'm sure you're going to hear from him. Um, read God's word, meditate. He will also speak to you through his word. And then you can take the next step. Okay. Anyway, you are already a doctor. I think it's just your uh, department. You need to just move and ask God. So nothing to worry about it. Just be praying for you as well, Anusha. I hope that helped. Okay. I'm sure you know which department you like to move. What is your interest? So you can pray about it. You can look for opportunities, whether you can move and move out from there to in another department. And I'm sure there are ample opportunities which you can. You needn't have to be confined to this department alone. There are ample opportunities, and I'm sure you can explore and then move out into the department that you like. Uh, so sometimes God has given us a mind that we need to use. Um, he's given us wisdom and knowledge, and so we need to take those steps um, and uh, he would guide us and lead us, OK? OK, so we will move on to chapter one of uh, code of conduct, OK? Now, we need to know that there is no code of conduct, no teaching, no, uh, 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 you know, no teaching on ethics, 
no wise counsel or set guidelines uh, to help a Christian minister uh, who does not take his or her personal walk with God seriously. Okay, so there's nothing that we, we can do to help somebody who's not willing to take their own personal walk with God seriously. No book, no code of conduct, no mentor, nobody can help you. Okay, so in this book, we're basically looking at how a minister of God should live, how a minister of God should conduct their lives. Okay, so the first thing we're going to be looking at is our own personal lives. Okay, now ministry. Uh, you know, is actually an overflow of our intimacy with God, okay? Your, how well you do in ministry, how well you are able to teach, preach, influence, bless, pray for others, minister, healing, deliverance, you know, give word of wisdom, knowledge, prophecy, flow in the gifts, uh, how well you're able to teach from God's word, the truths, the revelations from God's word, all depends on your personal time with God. Okay, so the more time you spend with God, the more the powerful your ministry is going to be. The more you're, you're going to make an impact in the lives of uh, people. Okay, so ministry is really an overflow of what God is doing in your own life personally. Okay, so it's very important that in our personal life that we cannot be slack. We need to be diligent. We need to be committed. We need to be sincere in our work, walk with um, God. And we need to keep our standards high. You know, the standard that God has set for us, be holy as I am holy. And we also need to be accountable to God. Okay, we need to hold ourselves accountable to God. So what are some of the things we need to do in our personal life? We need to, you know, schedule a daily time with God in the secret place, a time where we meet God, where a time when we are spending time in worship, prayer, reading God's word and meditating on God's word. And we need to keep a consistent practice of keeping that time that we spend with God. If you're spending time every day in the morning at four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, or for some of you, it's late nights, we need to be consistent in our practice of our private communion with God. Because what happens if we are consistent in our, uh, um, in our personal time with God in the secret place, you know, whatever we uh, experience in the secret place, we receive from God, you know, what God pours into our life that we are going to carry along with us everywhere we go. Where is the kingdom of God? What did Jesus say? The kingdom of God is where? Where is the kingdom of God? In heaven? It is within you. Yes. Okay, thank you, it's true. <laughs> That was so loud. Sorry. <laughs> that came like a shock. Anyway, can you please reduce the volume? Brother Cyril, can you please reduce the volume? Thank you, Gertrude. Yes, the kingdom of God is within us. Okay, so uh, wherever we go, the kingdom of God is manifested or is made known. Okay, so wherever we go, we carry along with us what we have received from God, you know, through uh, with us throughout the day and when, what, when we meet people, we pass on what we are receiving, what we are experiencing in our relationship, in our walk with God. So it's important to maintain a disciplined, uh, consistent life of worship, prayer, and, uh, you know, meditating on God's word every day. Okay. Now it's important for us, how can we maintain a consistent time with God every day, that consistent practice every day, you know, what will keep us going? What do you think will keep us going? How can we be consistent in our reading of God's word, meditating, spending time with God every day, having our quiet time every day? When we are hungry for more of God. Yeah. No, of course, when you're hungry and you're thirsty, what happens? You will go and eat. You will go and find something to drink. Okay. So we need to keep on in that state of being hungry for more of God. I want more of his word, more of his revelation, more of his power, more of his anointing. Okay. 
The second thing we need to do in our personal lives is as ministers of God, we need to strengthen our character. Okay, our character is very, very important. Okay, um, uh, we, you know, uh, um, we have sometimes we think as ministers of God, we've come to a level of godliness. That's okay. We are happy there, you know. And we also think, hey, you know, I'm a godly, I'm a good character person. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't use bad words, I don't uh, fight with people. So, and I like other Christians or like other unbelievers. So, I'm godly. Okay. It's it's not a good place to be in. We always need to, you know, um, continue to, uh, you know, get. Uh, to continue to be more like Christ, you know, move to new levels of godliness and a maturity in our character. Because if we feel we are happy in a place, it's like, you know, I'm happy here, I'm godly, I'm not doing anything bad. So very, it's, it's not a good place or safe place to be because, you know, we are not exercising our spiritual godliness or our strengths. Uh, we're just going with what we have already. So suppose you don't exercise your muscle. If you don't exercise, use one hand or one leg, what will happen? Slowly, there will be, you know, that part of your body will become inactive, right? You need to use your muscles, okay? In the same way, if you stop exercising your muscles, it gradually weakens, you know? The same way in our spiritual lives and in our character, okay? We need to keep a check on our character, our character is our moral fiber. It's a very core of our being, who we are. Okay. And uh, it's a level of godliness that we walk in private. That means when nobody is watching you, okay, it's, you, you know, your, your character is also developed in the secret place when nobody is uh, watching. Okay. So uh, we need to develop our character because character is developed over time. And uh, how is our character developed over time as we obey God, as we continually uh, submit and yield to God every day, okay? When we do that, our character will mature, we become more uh, Christ-like, and we need to keep a careful watch over our character, and we need to keep strengthening it every um, day, okay? How do we strengthen our character every day? We just invite the word of God and the Holy Spirit to work in our lives and also, you know, the influence of people, godly people, mentors who can mentor us, people in our lives who can speak into our lives. So we need to, you know, uh, grow in our character, mature in our character. And how do we do that? Through his word, his spirit and influence of godly uh, people uh, will help us to rise to new levels in our character. Okay. Um, and also we know that when we are uh, believers or we are in Christian ministry, we will always face temptation. There will always be areas in our life where Satan will target to bring us down. So we need to continually keep a guard. You know, we need to continually keep a guard, watch our character, keep up our defenses, you know, and we need to keep a guard and strengthen our character in all areas. Look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. He says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Okay. So we need to strengthen and build our character. The third thing we need to do is, you know, we need to, um, um, you know, um, just depend, wait on God to learn new revelations, new truths. And, um, you know, when we do that, we need to, um, uh, uh, you know, practice that in our own lives. You know, first, it's important before we teach, before we preach, that we hear from God, we are taught of God, we, uh, you know, we meditate on his word, we receive his word, we practice what we receive, uh, and our lives are aligned to God and what he's teaching us, and then we are, you know, going out and teaching that or ministering that to uh, 
people okay so sometimes we think as ministers of god you know we can just preach and teach without even practicing it and living uh, it out ourselves well we, sh we shouldn't be doing that we need to uh, it's important that we align ourselves we are first walking in god's ways we're aligning our own lives to god's word to his voice the voice of his word the voice of his spirit and out of that what we experience we share that to others okay so something that we have to maintain a self-discipline in our ministry that we will not teach something that we do not practice first okay now there are times when uh, we there are some times when we want we have to uh, teach some things from god's word where you know something way into the future you know, God is calling us into some things in the future that he is calling us to do. He is moving us as a church. He's moving us as a people of God um, when others have not gone. So those times, you know, we have not lived it out ourselves, but God is imparting it to us. God is impressing it to us. So what we need to do is we need to study God's word. We need to, we can preach it and teach it, but also we need to press forward to move in to the higher realms that God is imparting to us or impressing upon our hearts and God, where God is promising to move us as a people group, as a church or a Bible study uh, group. Now, there are some times, you know, as, um, uh, as um, ministers of God, we um, have to preach and teach uh, some areas in our life where we have not personally experienced. Now, for example, you know, I work with children and I don't have children myself, but I will be counseling parents, you know, how to, uh, you know, how to discipline children, how to help children out in their problems, in their difficulties. So at those times, I have not been a parent. I don't have children, but uh, from the experiences that I've gained and from my learning and from the word of God, I just basically give practical tips uh, from how I've seen my parents parent me. Uh, what I sense God is telling me, I have to wait and listen to the Holy Spirit and also from the word of uh, God. So for example, if a man of God is not married, of course he can preach and teach what the Bible says about marriage but even though he's not married okay but most of the times you know um, what we need to do is we need to practice before we preach or teach okay now there are some times when we preach things which we have failed in the past in our own lives but it's important for us to know that that is dealt with. We have dealt it with God. God has forgiven us. We have overcome it. We have learned lessons. So we are actually preaching and teaching from how God has ministered, helped us to overcome, and what we have experienced. And those messages will be very, very powerful. Okay. The next one is be a voice, not an echo. Okay. Be a voice, not an um, echo now you know it's important for us to you know to desire for god to speak to us instruct us to reveal from his word okay now it look at what isaiah chapter 50 verses 4 and 5 says can somebody read that please isaiah chapter 50 verses 4 and 5 it's in italics Ital Ital isaiah chapter 50 verse 4 and 5 the lord had the Lord God has given me the tongue of the land that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me mor morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the land. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious nor did I turn away. Yeah. So here it says, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned okay that i should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary so how do you know what sermon to preach to which people group what message to give what word what prophecy what advice to give is you know and how can your tongue be of a learned person is somebody who waits on god to hear from god so here the prophet is saying God awakens him, wakes him up morning by morning. He awakens his ear, that means a ear of his spirit man, to hear the things that God wants to impart through him to the people. 
Okay, so you know, if you've heard sermons and they're very, very powerful sermons, they have powerful truths, powerful revelations, it's because the man or the woman of God has actually waited on God for God to reveal what is the word to give to the specific people in the time or season that they are in or what to preach to this congregation and the word that comes out is powerful because you can hear this person say I was praying and asking waiting on God and God gave me this word and when the truth comes out the truth is so powerful okay so it's important for us to desire to wait and to hear from God and what he speaks to us in the secret we need to proclaim it out in the public that is why our personal time with god is so so um, important okay so when we are, when we preach and teach the understanding and the revelation we receive from god through our personal time and through our personal listening from God, they are very, very powerful. And that time it becomes the voice of God. That means God himself speaking through us and it does not become an echo. You know what's an echo? When you're hearing your own voice, you know, the echo is not as clear as your own voice. Okay. But sometimes what we do as people is we listen to other preachers we um, say, oh, wow, what a powerful revelation, what a powerful truth, you know. And uh, we think we can just take that same, borrow that same message and preach it to our congregation. And we see the results are not as powerful as when that man or God or woman of God preached it to that congregation. Why? Because it was what God wanted that man or woman of God, he revealed to them to speak to that people group in that specific context, in that specific situation. But if you are just borrowing that and you're just speaking it to some people and you, you feel that revelation is powerful, it's not going, it may not work. Why? Because that is not God's word for the people in your place, in your season, in their time that he wants them to receive. And also because you are just taking that revelation and speaking it without it without that becoming part of your own life without you understanding it without it becoming so much of your own um, experience and when you're preaching that it just becomes an echo and not the voice of God or it's it's not going to benefit much so even if we hear from other preachers it's important for us to listen to the revelation, understand it, experience it for ourselves, and then preach it when God wants us or if God wants us to reveal that to the people group that we are ministering to or speaking to. Okay? Did you all understand what I'm saying? Be a voice, not an echo? Yes. So it's important for us to hear from God. So even if you Bible college students are preaching every... You have your roster, right? Who is preaching which day? You know, just don't take something that you want to and speak, but say, God, what is the need of the students in our Bible college? What do you want me to speak? Show me. And God will lead you to the passage and God will also give you the revelations and then the truths. Just, just don't hear from God and Google a message or Google uh, the contents and then come and preach it. Okay. But you know, read God's word, meditate and say, God, I want you to give me the message, the points. What are the truths you want me to speak? OK, the next thing is as ministers of God, we need to keep our lifestyle very, very simple. OK, keep your lifestyle simple. Don't put on a show. Don't be somebody, you know, some preacher, some man or woman of God copying their style, copying their way of dressing and all of those things. Um, our life is not a show to be put on. You know, God designed you to be who you are. Don't be somebody else. Okay. Um, and also don't get uh, entangled with the affairs and the influence of this world. Okay. Um, look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2 verse 4 to Timothy. He says, you know, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who is enlisted himself as a soldier. So we are not here to please people around us, okay? So don't put on a show. There's no need for us to pursue a bigger house, a bigger car, with the latest gadgets, lavish living, lifestyle, like some pastors, men and women of God, you know. Uh, it's just keep your life simple. If you need a bigger house because your family is growing, there's 
you know, God is not going to be told that from you. If you need a bigger car to take more people in your congregation, you know, it's it's okay. But just keep your lifestyle very, very simple. You know, um, um, don't do things for the sake of showing people because those who have done it have fallen into a trap um, and, um, and you know, have, have been led astray from God. They've gone away from their um, ministry. Learn to be content with your what God has blessed you with. You know, Paul, again, writing to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, he says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay? So we need to be, um, we need to live with a holy discontent. That means in the things of God, we shouldn't be content. We need more and more, more of revelations, more of truth, more of his word, more of the move of God, more of the anointing of God, more of signs, miracles, and wonders. But when it comes to our relationship or with the things of this world, you know, we need to be uh, godliness with contentment is great um, gain. Okay? Um, you know, and and it's not wrong for us if we are a business people or you know we are in a in a in a corporate firm in a big firm uh, to move up the ladder of success to do well in our business to earn more money. There's nothing wrong in earning more money. There's nothing wrong in in enhancing our business, enlarging our business. But we need to know that you know the the. Uh, even as God blesses us with our finances, more wealth, um, more income, more salary, you know, we need to know that it should be used, uh, that what God is blessing us, we can use it for the enhancement or the furtherance of the building of his kingdom, okay? To further the cause of his kingdom, not to buy more land, more property, you know, build more things like the rich man, but you know, to give into the kingdom of God, to give into mission work so that the work of God, the kingdom of God can further, can pursue and can reach uh, the parts of this world. Okay. And Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says, set our minds on things above and not things of the earth. Okay. Now, another thing that we need to also keep in mind as ministers of God is if you're not intellectual, don't pretend to be intellectual. You know, some of us pretend to be we're very smart, we know everything, you know, very intelligent. If you're not wealthy, don't pretend to be wealthy, okay? Uh, don't take pride in just moving with the rich people. You know, some of us, we want to move with the rich people. We want to have contacts with all rich people, um, uh, you know, but, um, you know, so that people will look up to us and, you know, it will be a statement that we make, a style statement, a status that we have. My uncle who was a pastor, he always says, I'm a friend of the rich to help the poor. Okay? He used to say, I'm a friend of the rich to help the poor. So he's a friend of the rich to, to you know, help them to use their resources, that the wealth that God has given them to help the uh, poor people. Okay? Um, but it's important for us to connect with and relate with all kinds of people. Um, like it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 16, be of the same mind towards one and other. Connect with all kinds of people, whether it's rich people, medium class, poor people, relate with everyone, bless everyone, minister to everyone. Just don't do things because you're going to get benefited from one people group and avoid the other people group because we are not going to receive anything from them. So the important thing is uh, to watch our life, to keep our life very, very simple and not to get into the rut of this world where we want more and more, where we are trying to make a statement for ourselves, a style statement, a status symbol, and all of those things. Because when we get caught in that, we will lose our focus on what God has called and purposed us to do. Okay. The next thing is to keep our heart and to guard pure and to guard our motives. Okay. Now, the biggest challenge as a believer and in Christian ministry is to maintain a pure and a clean heart. Okay. Sometimes when we look at people on the outside, we can think, okay, what a holy person, what a, you know, a great man, woman of God, you know, not doing anything wrong, just very good. All that is sometimes in our outward show, we, you know, um, we can 
we can also deceive ourselves in saying, hey, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't, uh, you know, go to pubs, I don't uh, use bad language, I don't, I'm not like the world, I'm very simple, and all of those things. But there can be subtle things in our lives which opens the door to the enemy which we can fool other people around us but you know we can't fool god because god is interested in our character he looks at our attitudes our desires our motives and the intents of our heart so what do i mean you know sometimes you know we can be doing ministry we can do the right ministry but we can do it with a totally different motive a desire a passion or an agenda a Passion, desire, agenda, motive can be to seek our own glory, our own fame, our own recognition. And um, rather than seeking God's glory or seeking God, uh, you know, God be glorified, God be, um, you know, known to people. It is all about I, me, myself. Okay, so that comes in very, very subtly. And we need to watch that because some people think, hey, that's not wrong, wrong. Drinking is wrong, smoking is wrong, adultery is wrong. I'm not doing all of those things, you know. But even this seeking our own glory, you know, can bring our downfall. Because you know how Satan fell when he was seeking his own glory. He thought he was powerful enough and he can also be worshipped as God. Pride, okay. The other thing is our thoughts, lustful thoughts. Nobody can see our thoughts, read our thoughts, okay. But we can hide our thoughts in, you know, the front of people, nobody will know that we're having lustful thoughts. We can appear holy to people, but God knows our thoughts, okay? And, uh, you know, when we have these lustful thoughts and we are watching lustful things, things that are not right, not pleasing to God's sight, you know, um, he knows about it, okay? Um, sometimes we can also be filled with envy and jealousy when we look at other ministers of God, you know, when God is using them greatly, they have greater opportunities. You know, we, we are filled with envy, uh, jealousy, hatred, and we do everything to, you know, assassinate their character, talk bad about them, pull them down, you know, or uh, we compete with them, how we can be better than them or how we can do better than them in their ministry. Okay, so that is why it's important for us to Look at all of these heart attitudes. Always be open before God and say, God, you know, when we pray, when every day we need to be open and say, God, look at my heart. Look into my heart. Is there anything that's displeasing? Anything that has come in, you know, any pride, any lust, any uh, jealousy, hatred, bitterness, God, show me. Play your finger on it so that I can repent. I can ask you for forgiveness and I can overcome um, that. Okay. Another thing that we need to guard our hearts and keep our motives pure is from being insecure. Sometimes when others do better than us, preach better than us, you know, or um, sometimes people from our congregation go to other churches or go to other prayer meetings or we are having a Bible study. They go to other churches, go for other Bible studies, other prayer meetings. You know, we become very, very insecure as pastors, right? We don't want them to go. So we are behind them. Why didn't you come? You should be here. Why did you go there? Whose church you went? And then they say, we went to this church. You say, you know that pastor, that pastor did this, this, this. This pastor, the pastor is teaching all these wrong things. You should not go there. So, you know, don't be afraid. You know, um, let people go. Let people receive from other men and women of God. If they really belong to you, uh, to your family, you know, they will come back. But don't be controlling and uh, don't become insecure. Okay, now all of us will struggle in some of these areas, but we need to be open before God, you know, um, and uh, what do we do? Okay, we need to go before God and we need to ask God to judge our motives, to judge our thoughts, our feelings, our motives, our desires. Say, God, judge me in all of these areas. See if there's any wicked way in me show me if there's anything that is wrong and invite god to help us you know in our thoughts in our intents in our motives you can pray what the psalmist prays 
in Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Okay, so ask the Lord to cleanse you, purify you. He's a refiner's fire. Ask his, him to, you know, pour, uh, pour down his fire and to burn up all the filth, all the unnecessary things that are in you. Let this word of God and the spirit of God cleanse and wash your hearts and your minds. Okay, now some things when we pray and ask God, you know, the immediate cleansing happens. But some areas where the, the sin is very powerful, you know, and um, uh, the strongholds are there, we need more time. So at those times, what we can do is take scripture passages on those specific sins, meditate on it, spend more time fasting and praying and um, you know, um, important for us to guard and keep our motives and our hearts pure and our thoughts and our desires within uh, the will and the plan and purpose of God. When we do that, you know, the half the battle has been won and we continue to, you know, pursue the things of God, pursue holiness, righteousness, and, um, you know, what God requires of us. Okay. The other thing that we need to do as ministers of God in our personal lives is not to kill our conscience. Okay. Now, what is our conscience? The inner voice of our spirit. A conscience is God given. Uh, it tells us what is right and what is wrong. Okay. Your conscience also bears witness with the Holy Spirit. Remember, we learned that. You know, the inner voice, the Holy Spirit, we learn that our conscience also bears witness with the Holy Spirit, okay? Which means we need to keep our conscience pure because the Holy Spirit bears witness in our conscience. So we know whether it's the Holy Spirit speaking to us or when the Holy Spirit is telling us what to do, okay? So... Um, as Christian ministers, we are to couple our ministry with a pure conscience, okay? And a clear and a pure conscience is necessary for us to walk in reverence towards God. It's also important to control our tongue. Some of us are not able to control our tongue. We just speak whatever we want to speak, you know, whether it is... Um, filthy words or whether it is words that are, uh, uh, you know, always condemning, putting down others, putting down ourselves, uh, speaking words that are negative, you know, it's because our conscience is not pure, okay? So uh, when our conscience is pure, um, it helps us to walk in reverence with God, it keeps, helps us to keep our tongues in control, uh, to also keep our appetites that means our sexual appetites, our sexual desires, our, uh, our own uh, appetites, our own carnal fleshly desires, our appetites uh, free from every kind of, uh, you know, love of money, love of, uh, you know, the, 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 the flesh and the pride of life. Okay. But if you don't listen to our conscience, we suppress our conscience you know, we will kill the voice of our conscience and we will also sear our conscience, okay? Sear means it's like an iron box. When you keep a hot iron box on, a, on your shirt or your trouser or your dress that you're wearing and it's very hot, it, what will happen? It will catch, right? It, it's, it, it actually sears your conscience. That means your conscience becomes so dead. Right? Suppose you take hot iron and keep it on your skin, your uh, nerve endings in that part will become good as dead. Okay? So it's important not to let our conscience die. What happens if our conscience dies? Then even when we are doing wrong, we can justify our actions. You know, you have seen people who have been in ministry, men and women of God, who are just, you know, believers, born again, you know, um, they say they're born again, but they are living immoral lives or they're, you know, committing adultery or they're doing, you know, they, you know that, you know, um, what they're doing is not right. And you can say, how can they do it? It's because, and they can justify their 
actions. They can actually even pull out chapter and verse to prove what they're doing is right. They can give you excuses. They can give you theological uh, proofs. And, um, you know, uh, why is because their conscience is so dead to that. So don't come to a place where your conscience is dead. You know, I work with drug addicts and alcoholics and they come to the clinic and when they put their, you know, pull up their jeans uh, just below their knees to treat their wounds, their legs is like elephant legs. You know, elephant's legs, how big it is. It's because their legs have caught gangrene. You know what is gangrene? You know, when they keep injecting these drugs into the sun, there's pus that is formed and it's not cleaned up and all that. It becomes gangrene. It can move up and it can even kill the person. And they know they're going to die, but they'll come to the clinic and they will just get their wound cleaned up. They will listen to all the therapy sessions, but they will go back and they will inject in the same place. They will take drugs in the same, you know, inject it in the same place. Why? Because their conscience is so dead to what they are doing. Now, terrorists, the first time you take a gun and kill somebody, you're not able to sleep for one week, two weeks, right? But then the, you see after a couple of months, the terrorists can take a gun and can shoot anywhere. They won't see whether it's a child, a baby. If it is a pregnant lady, they will just go randomly and shoot anyone and everyone. Because why? Their conscience is so dead so don't let your conscience die it's important for us not to let it die not to suppress our conscience not to kill the voice of your own conscience because that is a dangerous place to be and that is why many christian ministers or those people in ministry leading prayer groups or whatever have fallen into serious uh, sins so important to keep our conscience clear and not to suppress our conscience okay Keep listening to your conscience when it tells you, hey, what you're saying is wrong, what you're watching is wrong, what you're doing is wrong, what you're saying is wrong, you're copying, you're stealing, you're doing things that is wrong, you're saying things, you know, immediately stop and listen to your conscience. It makes a huge difference. The next one is fire up your passion for purity. Okay. I'm not reading up all the references because of the lack of time. I like you all to go back and read, take time to read those references. Okay. Um, look at what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the last. Uh, okay. Somebody can read that, please. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the, from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Amen. Yeah, so here it says, you know, pursue, uh, flee youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who are called on the Lord, a pure heart. Okay, so it's important for us to maintain personal purity. Uh, we need to cleanse ourselves of whatever is impure and we need to be vessels of honor you know sanctified set apart for god's use okay so sometimes if you're looking at people who god is using greatly and you're wondering hey i'm in the same ministry i'm also doing ministry and god is not using me as greatly as that man or woman it's it may be because that man or woman has you know has set them as their lives apart as a vessel of honor a sanctified for the master's use so that you know, more of God's anointing and power is flowing through their lives. If you want God to use you mightily in the mighty anointing and power, yes, it's important to read God's word and pray, but also important for us to, you know, have a pure heart and pure motives. That is very, very important because God will not waste his anointing and pouring out his anointing in a vessel that is not fit 
and we know that will waste that anointing. Okay, so we need to keep our vessels. Our vessels are the body, our bodies. Our bodies are the temple of the living God, and we need to ask God to sanctify us. The sanctifying work is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. It does not mean that the, as soon as we are born again, the Holy Spirit begins His sanctifying work. The Holy Spirit will sanctify us to the extent that we yield ourselves and we submit our Cells. To the extent you willing, you're willing to yield and submit. To that extent, the Holy Spirit will work in your life. The Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. He will not push you and force you. If you are open, the Holy Spirit will sanctify you. So you're, you might be wondering, you know, um, even though I am born again, why do I have so many shortcomings or weaknesses in my body? Why am I not able to overcome it? Is the Holy Spirit not working in me? No, the Holy Spirit is working in you. It's because you are not yielded and surrendered your life completely to in every area for the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. That is why it's important to know that when we accept Jesus as our Lord and well, Jesus as our Savior, some people just accept him as their Savior, but not as their Lord, which means I want him to be my Savior so that I can go to heaven, but I'm going to be the Lord of my life. I am still going to, you know, drive my own life and do what I want to do. But, but yielding to God, uh, accepting Jesus as our Lord, uh, Savior is not just Savior, but also as our Lord and as our savior okay so it's important for us to yield and submit and to you know keep up that passion of purity always so sometimes we can get so caught up in ministry we can get caught up in doing god's word preaching god's word you know attracting crowds doing great uh, programs in our church but if we are not looking at our own lives, our character, you know, keeping ourselves open before God, um, maintaining a right, right heart attitude. We can compromise, we can adjust, we can adapt to sins, which we will, you know, will dominate our lives. And one point of time, we cannot con tolerate or control these sins, and these sins will control us, and that will be our end of our ministry the only way we can guard ourselves is to keep our passions pure and fired up all the time okay the next thing we need to do is we need to set moral personal moral boundaries okay uh, so it's good as men and women to set up some personal boundaries for me as what are some of the personal boundaries i set up is you know i don't personally counsel a man okay uh, or even uh, somebody who is a teen, you know, I don't counsel, I don't um, go alone with somebody as, you know, in, in a close room with a man or a woman, I'm sorry, man or a young person, youth, you know, counseling them. I, if there's any counseling that need is there, I always will refer them to another male figure, you know, when, um, I also don't uh, hug or hold or hands or, you know, men or women. I keep my personal distance even in the teams that I handle. Um, I um, I don't speak too much, talk too much, what sends a lot of WhatsApp messages, you know, or email too much, call up the male uh, core team members. Only minimal things what I need to do, I do I very relate, I relate to them on a very minimal, you know, on a very um, ministry level basis, not getting into very personal uh, details. Also, don't handshake, uh, you know, with men or give them a hug or hold them close and all of those things. Those are some personal boundaries that I maintain. And it's good for all of us to maintain some uh, personal uh, boundaries as well. Okay. We just have two more minutes. We will stop here. We just have a few more uh, points in this lesson before we move on. Any questions so far? Okay, this is all about being more practical in our own lives. So even as we looked at some of these things, it's important for us to uh, look into our own lives, see where we need to work on these things, you know. Uh, maintain our per own personal boundaries uh, with people. Also, you know, spend more time in God, uh, in the secret place because from there we receive the power. 
and um, the anointing and the revelations of truth that God wants us to minister to others and also, you know, keep a pure heart and a pure motive before God and ask God to cleanse us at all times. Any questions before we end class? Uh, we've not, uh, I've not looked at uh, the references, so request you to please read through. Okay, we've just gone through a little, a few pages important for you to read. Okay, we finished uh, this book on uh, receiving God's guidance, so we'll fix a, time, a date for uh, the assessment and maybe um, post uh, the dates when we can have the next assessment on uh, this book, Receiving God's Guidance. But today, the in-person students will be doing uh, their um, assessment on fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. And also, I think there's one online student, Dibya, will be doing. Yes, Gretrude, you have a question? Yes, sister, you know the assessment. Uh, I didn't get much time to go through it because it was, I had problem opening it, you know, so... I feel, I, I mean, we should get a little more time, you know, to answer those questions. Yeah, I think I gave you two whole days, so maybe... Yeah, but, yeah, I know I couldn't open it, you know, because... Yeah, sorry, uh, I apologize for the inconvenience. And next time I'll ensure that it's it will, as soon as I release it, that by default it does not go to um, preventing you from opening it, but you can open it, yeah. Okay, sister, thank you. Thank you, Gertrude. Okay, thank you everyone for joining class today. Have a blessed weekend. See you next week.